and welcome to the virtual edition of our year-round screening series, Film Independent Presents. I'm Rachel Bleemer, Director of Events. Uh, I wanted to yeah, welcome you guys to a very exciting Q&A, but before we do that, I have to thank some of our partners and our loyal supporters. Uh, thank you to the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. Thank you to Vision Media, our screening partner, and thank you to the Los Angeles Times, our media partner. For those of you watching today, there's a little question box at the bottom of your screen. Please take advantage of that and ask our panelists questions towards the end of the uh, conversation. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop blabbering um, and welcome on, and our very honored uh, guest moderator today. Please welcome film critic, writer, and editor, Armide Tinabu. Please take it from here. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. We're Hello. so excited today to be chatting about Farewell More. It's a beautiful film. I'm sure you've all seen it by now. So we're just going to jump right in to talk about this gorgeous story. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask was, Equa, how did you come up with this story? I know some of it was in part inspired by your own family and experiences. Thank you. Um, the story is inspired by an aunt and an uncle who were married in Tanzania in the mid 90s. And you know, soon after their wedding, my uncle got a student visa to come to the US and came with every intention of bringing my aunt. And at that point, they're five months old right behind him. And you know, to this day, 2020, they've been stuck in a never ending cycle of visa applications and rejections and applications and rejections. And over the years, just watching how their lives had changed, how they had changed as individuals in order to remain hopeful that they would still one day be reunited. Um, I was inspired by the what if story. What if the visa was no longer the mountain that they were climbing and they were able to be reunited? Where do they begin at that point? Um, so following along with these characters and in their shoes as they discover the new, the new world, their new beginnings. Now, Haria, how did you get involved as producer? Because it is very much this story of a homecoming in a way for this family, but they're also strangers. So they meet at JFK and their world really exists in Brooklyn at that moment. So can you talk a little bit about your journey into the film? Yeah, absolutely. Echo and I, we've been working together for so many years. Uh, we've been friends for even more. And uh, when we were talking about just this experience, um, she was writing about it and I just kept encouraging her to write about it. And uh, and we knew that we wanted to tell this story as a feature. Um, and we just, it's been a long journey. We started in 2016, I think it was, Equa mm -hmm. or 2015. And uh, little by little, we produced a proof of concept uh, that did really, really well in film festivals. That was the precursor to the, the feature length version of this film. And from there, we just built up steam and momentum and folks who really felt the heart of the story and loved us as collaborators and wanted to team up on board. And along the way, the, the that little engine that could just kept going. And before we knew it, we were in, we were working with these lovely, these lovely talent, you know, so, so it's just been an amazing journey. And we're really excited to present the film to the audiences this Friday. Wonderful. Now, before I jump into the talent, I really want to talk about the fact that this story was told in three parts. So we get Walter's perspective, we get Sylvia's perspective, and then we get Esther's perspective. And but why was it important for you to show all of those varied perspectives from the moment they meet each other until the film uh, concludes? Um, I mean, there was a little bit of indecision um, as far as whose story I wanted to follow coming out of the short prequel that Haria mentioned, um, that had been Walter's story. And so Walter was the most present in my mind when I started writing. Um, but I thought it was a little cliche to tell a story about a man who had an affair and you know him juggling these two women. So I thought, well, maybe the daughter's perspective, but as a young black teen dancing with music, then I felt like that could, just too easily get categorized as like a black teen dance movie. And I didn't want that for, you know, cause I feel like this movie is so much more than that. So then I thought, well, okay, maybe I'll just do from both of their perspectives and see what happens. And so, you know, I spent about six to eight months writing it from Walter and Sylvia's perspective. And then it just became just abundantly clear that it didn't make sense to not have Esther's perspective because her story is a linchpin to both of their stories. And so added that on, but I mean, really overall, it's just, I was just fascinated by this idea that 
even though they're all experiencing this one big triumphant event, um, they're having very distinct and unique experiences of the one unique triumphant event. And I didn't want to dismiss anybody's experience, you know, uh, for the other person. I wanted us to be able to actually walk in each other's shoes so as not to feel like we already know that story and we know what they're gonna do and what they should have done, but actually like walk with them and see what it's like. Mm -hmm. And Natare, I love Walter's story because it was so nuanced. So obviously he's a man who's been without his family for 17 years. He hasn't been celibate, he's been living his life. He has a new love, Linda, but when his family comes, he tries to do the honorable thing. Can you talk about your approach to that character and the way that you understood him as a man? Uh, I th thank you so much for the kind words. And I, I think the operative word you said is he tries. He tries to do the right thing. Uh, and that's where in the drama lies because untangling the heart is sometimes one of the most complicated things to try to do. Um, but what's interesting is that he was open with Linda about his situation. He didn't present himself as a single man. Uh, he presented himself as a husband uh, and a father and that he was trying to bring this family here. So it's interesting that, you know, the kind of person that would be willing to engage in a relationship like that and then still extract themselves. So I found it, you know, the story for me shows how it is possible to love two people at the same time and, and how difficult it is to, to do that and the cost it takes to, to let go and what it takes to try to reconnect with someone um, long lost, especially if they've only existed in your imagination, which is most of the part for his daughter, um, as a, especially a teenage daughter, um, which, you know, there are mysteries on the, of themselves because uh, they're still trying to figure themselves out. They want nothing to do with their parents usually. Uh, and part of growing up is rebelling. So for me, it was really beautiful, sort of complex layered love story, um, not just with the mistress, but with the wife and with the daughter as well. And I feel like it's, you know, it's not a happy ending, but we see that they've made steps closer to get, to get closer together. Mm -hmm. And I just want to point out that the fact that Linda is okay with this situation, it just shows how common it is. Like when Equa and I were making this film, there were so many people like, you know, who we told about the film and they were like, oh my God, that's my story. That's my, my, my family or my uncle or my aunt, you know? And so with Walter, when he shares a situation with Linda, Linda understands because, you know, it's not something that is foreign, you know, to, or, or to be in this type of a situation. Granted, the length is 17 years, that's a long time, but this is an experience that's very common. Mm -hmm. Certainly, and you get to see sort of how he knows this one woman and doesn't know the wife that he marries. Yes. Um, and what I also found really interesting is as Sylvia and Walter sort of bond, Esther's left on the outskirts. So Zanab, I would really like to talk to you about Esther's crisis of faith. She's obviously very grateful to, to the Lord that she has made it back to her family, but she's also understanding and wrestling with the fact that things are not as she expected them to be. So can you discuss that a little bit? Um, I feel... Um... In, in Esther's case, I, I feel it's almost a case of, um, I feel somewhere that she was a little bit surprised at the, you know, when she comes upon the, uh, the, the, the knowledge that Walter has been having this other life. Um, I think it's a mixture of surprise and disappointment because I feel that the fact that she became so deeply religious almost put her in this bubble of um, naivete and uh you know thinking she wants this to work so badly she came over and she had like stars in her eyes and you know the romantic reunion and all that and i think it was it has to have hit her i certainly the way i felt esther i felt that it hit her in the gut a little bit like a punch to the stomach to think you know i've been faithful to you all this time and how could you not have been faithful to me so it's uh i could see her struggle and she needed to have that faith to hold on to faking herself into believing everything was going to be perfect. And um, 
Yeah, and I think Ontario was so perfect for the role because he's such a romantic person in real life. I mean, who says words like untangle the heart? Ontario <laughs> <laughs> says words like that, you know? And like he said, and I went, this is why he's perfect for the role. You know, the heart is perfect. <laughs> that is why we hired him. Isn't it so <laughs> tough? Like, you know, he's such a romantic person anyway. And um, and that's what uh, Linda, I, I mean, not Linda, I think that's what Esther remembers of him. <clears throat> romantic, that love that had gone away and she wanted to reconnect with that. So it was a sharp reawakening for her, I think, when she realizes, oh gosh, th things have changed. I have to face the fact that we don't know each other, we've grown apart, but we still have this child. We have to find our way back to this family. Certainly. And I think for a lot of that, Jamie sort of sees the differences in her parents. I'm sorry, Jamie, not Jamie. Um, Sylvia sees that, but Jamie, how can you talk about a little bit uh, how you sort of navigated that? You see this young, beautiful teen girl and she's in a whole new country, but you really see Sylvia adapt in a way that teens don't often adapt to their situations. And she does that through dance, which is something she does have in common with her father. So can you talk about that through line? And then I, I wanna pivot also to Echo and talk about dance as a through line in the film in general. Well, yeah, I mean, um, that's a beautiful discovery that I think Sylvia gets to have in the film, right? Is um, beforehand, uh, dance felt like her own private experience, her own um, something unique to her, right? And she gets understanding that that's something that she actually inherited from both her father and her mother, right? And what does that then mean? You know, as a teenager, you're trying to fit in, you're trying to find where your place is, you're trying to find how you belong. And then add on top of that, she's now being brought to another country. She's being reintroduced to this man that she hasn't seen for over for 17 years. Um, so already trying to fit in and then trying to reimagine where she fits in her family, right? And, and digest this new structure. Um, so what a gift it is when she learns of a shared love or a shared language between her mother and her father. Um, so a lot of the time she's she, she's just watching and taking in information and you know my favorite part of the film is when um Walter says to Sylvia gives her permission basically right to be free to to express herself to to express her art um and I think she needed that right cuz Sylvia you know it's funny I just realized it's like oh yeah Sylvia's an artist <laughs> she is and I I had never thought about that until like this <clears throat> week um and just in my own life, like what that means to, to get that permission um, to be free. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the one of the purposes of, aside from just loving and golden dance and music and wanting to, you know, have as much of that as I could um, and wanting to share that, you know, with many people who probably haven't heard or experienced it. Um, it you know, it, it is very, one of the things that I love about Angola and dance and music is that it has very specific um, purpose, you know, as Jamie just said, you know, for Sylvia's character, dance becomes a third language for her as a way of expressing herself and is very true to the style of dance that she practices, which is Kuduro, um, which is used by young Angolan young people um, as a way, as a platform for them to speak about the things that, you know, they're concerned about, you know, in a, in a society that doesn't have a lot of space for young people's voices. Um, dance and music is the place where they're able to talk about some really heavy things and what might look on the surface like this, your typical sort of hip hop dance style. Um, you know, people are talking about domestic violence and um, life after the war and economic hardships and all sorts of different things. And then for um, Walter's style of dance that he practices, which is kizem kizomba and semba, um, those you know are very beautiful sensual couples dances. Which, first of all, when do we ever get to see sensual couples dances from Africa? But <laughs> so wanting to showcase that. But you know, unlike other couples dances, salsa, bachata, um, kizomba does not rely on a regular foot pattern, and so in order to 
dance to Kizomba, there has to be a, a level of connection between the two dancers. Otherwise, there is no dance because the leader is merely reacting to the music and the follower is reacting to what the leader is doing. So there isn't anything to fall back on. And I just thought that's just an interesting um, metaphor for a, for a couple and mm -hmm. for a relationship where this couple used to be dance partners. They used to literally be in sync and in step and now they aren't. And therefore they're not able to dance and what do they do? So for all of them, dance and music becomes a way that we're able to get a window into some of their inner workings that they're that they're experiencing. Now, Harriet, can you talk to me about shooting this film? Because it is so authentically New York. How long did you guys take to shoot? How did you scout locations? And, and what was that like? Yeah, so the, for about a year, I think that I was in what I call soft prep, where literally I was going around to a lot of the locations in my neighborhood uh, that I knew probably would be in the film um, and just forming relationships with those business owners. The crew, they all tease me because I would get home in like 10 minutes, you know, because everything literally was in my neighborhood, you know, um, but just, I think we shot for like maybe almost 30 days, including the pickups um, roundabout. Uh, but for while Echo was writing the film, like we went through so many drafts of the film. Like I think at the end we had about 16 drafts of the script. Um, and as she said, she took almost a year to write it. And so little by little, I was just putting things together and putting things in place because we didn't know when we first started this journey, how much support we would get. You know, typically there's not a lot of support out there, you know, in independent film for this type of story. So we, we knew started from the beginning that we may have to go this alone. So we didn't have money. The thing that we had was time. So, you know, right from the beginning, I started working in, in, in soft prep, like just with forming relationships with some of those key um, department heads that I knew like, oh my God, if we get this person, I won't have to worry about this department. So I really want to get this person and just calling them up ahead of time and, you know, like just greasing the wheel, like, girl, how long has it been since we talked? You know, <laughs> <laughs> what have you been up to you know and uh and just little by little but people I think they just fell in love with the film like I didn't have to do too much convincing of course they loved us as filmmakers but again they just loved the story and then when they read the script Echo she did such an amazing job on the script that people just felt the heart of it and also like I said it's a very common experience like for me like my family it was incarceration, you know, like that separated us, you know, and for other families, it's immigration, you know, for other families, it might be, you know, because a parent works, you know, halfway across the country and only comes home on the weekends, but you feel like the essence of what it is, it's just about, you know, how do you cope with being separated from the people that you love, you know, and so I think when people read the script, they felt the heart of it, and they just wanted to get on board, something of it was really magical, honestly. Um, I was watching Onward, so, you know, that Onward is all about magic, so I guess that's what I'm talking about, magic, but it was really <laughs> magical. It was like, we didn't really have, a like, the, the challenges that we had, we just dealt with them, and we kept going, and along the way, we just kept meeting folks and, and, and collaborators and vendors and partners who wanted to help us, so I'm really proud of the film that we made, and I can't wait to release it. We're all excited as well. Uh, for Jamie, Natare, and Zanab, can you all talk about the family unit that you created on set? Because when we first meet your characters, they couldn't be more apart. And they slowly kind of drift back and forth towards one another as the film uh, presses on. So either, um, either one of you could talk about that. I nominate Natare. Thank you. <laughs> Take it away, Walter. Uh, well, thank you for the nomination. I'll pass it on to you next time. Um, I'll pass the baton now. This was, I felt, I've said this before, uh, and maybe that's why Zainab's asking me to say it, but I was in love with Zainab's work. <laughs> As a youth. I, I, I <laughs> said it <up> there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you ever seen her on Broadway or off Broadway, it's just like, I was just, blown away and wondered how this person does what they do. And so for the opportunity to get to work with her was a, such a gift. Um, and so for me, I felt like there's a connection or curiosity or a window in that I was just really curious to figure out how she worked and 
what it was just to be, what it was like just to be around her. And equally with Jamie, I was stunned just to, to hear, you know, this was her like first job out of school because she was such the consummate professional and was completely centered and uh, so focused. There's, a, there's, a, there's that kind of focus that you have when you're first right out of school too, that's more intense than anybody else. Cause you're like, <laughs> <laughs> you're just like, I'm just, I'm gonna get this, you know? And so I'd see her at the dance rehearsals and I didn't even know she was playing my daughter cause she was just so focused on like doing her dance and I didn't get a chance to say hello or, and then I realized later, you know, cause we kept passing each other from our dance rehearsals that, oh, she's also in the movie. <laughs> and I thought she was maybe a dancer who was taking dance classes. So I felt like we were lucky to have a two week prep. Um, and Equa was, uh, is, is truly the actor's director cause she, did all the work that we should have done on our own, you know, creating music playlists, having us improvise dialogue, what we were like before. So she really created this world for us. Uh, and because of the chemistry, I think we just, it just sort of, we all melted together. Um, but maybe you guys feel otherwise, I'll let you speak <laughs> and see. Maybe. No, that was, I mean, I was so grateful again, coming straight out of school and being trained in theater only to have Equa provide two weeks of, of improvising, of rehearsal, of figuring out what our relationship was in the family and, you know, even improvising what those phone calls were over the past 17 years, what, you know, all those intimate details. I love that. Like I, <laughs> that is like, I need that. And, um, and so that was, yeah, that was everything because we began to all figure out how each other worked and, and then it made everything easier when we showed up on set. Um, and like Tara said, the chemistry was just there. You know, the these are like fantastic actors to work with. Um, so, yeah. It was wonderful too, to be able to just sit down. It's so important that you got to sit down at that table mm -hmm. and read the script and hear the other voices as opposed to the voices in your head when you read it alone by yourself, just to hear the voices outside of your head and um, how the, you know, what they're saying lands on you. And um, I connected with the script initially reading it just because it's not very um, different from my background. I mean, I moved to England when I was like 10, or 10, almost 11. And so I hadn't met my parents in that whole time because they were both at a university in England. And so I was meeting them essentially for the first time, getting to know these people. So it was wonderful to be able to connect my own experience with what was on the, on the page. And also to be able to look at Ntare and Jamie and you know, superimpose their, their, what they brought to the script onto what was um, in front of me. It just made it so much more concrete and three-dimensional. So um, it made, by the time we got to the set, you know, you were just, you were just like the, like the dance, you're just following, you know, it's give and take, it's respond and reaction. So yeah, it was great that uh, Equa did that. Yeah. And I, that's why I love the ending. It's sort of really open-ended and nothing's quite resolved, but I wanted to talk to you about how you decided on that ending and, and what made you land there after 16, 15, 16 renditions of the script. Um, <laughs> it's a great question. I mean, I think part of it is that, you know, we, we start, it's a, the, the beginning of the film feels like an ending, right? That's usually like the ending of the movie is like, and then we're back together. Yay. Um, and that's where we begin. So where do you go from there? It's, it's almost like a false start because it really is, the, it's an ending to their visa issues, but it's the beginning of the rest of their lives. Um, and it didn't feel uh, accurate <laughs> or realistic that in the span of three to four weeks, you know, which is what we had imagined that the film would cover, that we'd get to the kind of conclusion where they're like, and then they lived happily ever after and we'll never have problems again. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I felt like what would, what felt right to me is that we end where they've sort of made an, a new, another beginning, where they've made the decision to start again. 
you know, sort of like, all right, let's take two. Um, you know, and and if we came back, you know, I think one of the things that Hari and I would say when we were talking about the film to people, you know, in pre-production is that if we came back for a sequel and we saw that the family was still together, we would be like, yeah, that's so sweet. I could see them work, you know, they really tried this family. I could see that. And if you came back and you didn't find them together, you'd be like, you know what? They really tried. Like I saw that family working and they, you know, so you could kind of see it go either way. Um, and it's really up to you to, I guess, wonder <laughs> what what work is gonna, cause it's work that, that obviously it has to come after that, but they've gotten to a place where they can agree upon, we're gonna try, we're, we're gonna make an attempt, we're gonna, start you know the the playing field has been leveled a little bit more better this time around and so you know take two let's try again um and that just felt more accurate and more real to me wonderful so i'm going to open it up to audience questions now we're all very excited because this film is coming out friday both on video on demand and anywhere the theaters are actually open right now during covid uh, but the first question comes from jonathan swartz he says i thought the story was very moving and inspiring did real life experiences figure into the story and if so how i think um a number of real life experiences colored the story i certainly didn't document anybody's experience and transcribe that for the script um, but most of my characters were influenced or by somebody or, you know, by an incident or a person, you know, whether it be just kind of their energy or the kind of person that they are um, and different thing, you know, aunties that I know um, who are uber religious and therefore were able to sort of inform um, Esther's character, you know, I, I did do a lot of research in terms of asking people about the work that they do. I, I, I interviewed a nurse, for example, an ER nurse, to like sort of get in the mind of an ER nurse and the kinds of sacrifices that they make, not only in their work, but how that kind of seeps into their personal life as well, um, where they might be making decisions that aren't particularly great for them <laughs> because they're saving other lives, um, you know, and things like that. And, you know, for Sylvia's character, for you know i was born in the us and left when i was five and grew up in kenya and then came back when i was 17 which is about the same age as sylvia's character um and for me dance and music were were my lifelines were sort of like the way for me to remember who i was and what was important and kind of helped me find my voice at that it was a little different i you know i didn't come from yeah, I, English was a first language for me. There was a lot of things that were different, but there were certain things that I was able to sort of insert into the script. Um, so yeah, just kind of borrowing bits and pieces from, from folks. For Nzinga, the neighbor, um, that was, you know, definitely a, a good friend of mine who's <laughs> Queen Africa <laughs> and my hairdresser. <laughs> a lot of people that I've met in Brooklyn who, you know, I... The, we know that character. If you lived in Brooklyn, you know that character. And so that was a conglomeration of a number of people as well. Wonderful. It was so great to see Jolly um, body. Yeah. She was fabulous. Fabulous as always. Uh, Robin Swartz says, what a beautiful film. Can you explain the title and how long did production last? Um, yeah, so, you know, Farewell Amour, we had a lot of questions about that because, as Echo mentioned, you know, the family, they get back together in the opening scene. And so what in the world, why do you call a film Farewell Amour? And for us, it was because, you know, throughout their journey, these characters, they had to be okay with saying goodbye to, you know, who they thought they were who they thought each other were and be able to accept, you know, this is the reality of of the situation now. It's not about, you know, that memory that we had, you know, 17 years ago. It's not about, you know, this perception that we had through the telephone and through the Skypes and whatever. So it's about like saying goodbye to that. So farewell to, to that past and embracing, you know, what this new reality is and, and, and going off into the future. So that's kind of where the title, um, why we stuck with Farewell Amore. Um, and then, uh, 
in terms of how long production lasts, you know, the actual shoot, I think was like I said, of maybe four weeks or so. And then we were in post for about five months. Uh, it was really a, a really, really quick post where we had two editors. We were living in dark rooms for so long because we knew um, we wanted to premiere at the Sundance Film Festival. And so wrapping up shoot in August, you know, and we actually started editing on day two of our of our production so we were editing the whole time that we were shooting um and wrapping up you know the shoot in august and rushing through the edit rushing through color through sound you know titles it was like a whirlwind and so when we actually got to the sundance film festival in january it was like we were emerging like oh there's life out there you know there's <laughs> actual people you know outside of these dark rooms and so uh that's kind of like the summary of uh, the length of production and post and speaking of Sundance, uh, Jay Berman asked, what was it like to watch the film with an audience, which is something we really got lucky <laughs> to, to do that at the top of the year. So that's for everyone. What was that like for you all? Well, that's why I produce. Producing is like so challenging. It's like you get all the bumps, all the bruises. You cry, blood, sweat, and tears, little like, you know, fanfare about your work and what you do, but to be able to sit there and watch it with an audience is just amazing and hear them laugh and you know feel like them moved in certain scenes and look around and see the tears in the eyes like that's for me personally that's why I actually produce for that moment. I mean it's very yeah. special it was also you know as Maria mentioned we literally I think we finished the film probably five or six days before we showed it and so we had been living in dark rooms for about three months and then was in a dark room, but all of a sudden there are all these other people in the dark room with us, mm -hmm. which was a little weird at first. <laughs> and took some getting used to, but certainly just being able to feel the the audience's energy was just so incredible. And to watch it with to watch it with the cast, because it was the first time they got to see it too, um, was really, really special. Yeah, I remember being so nervous i kept trying i was like i was trying to sit next to zainab and um nana because i was like so nervous of you know watching it and then having other people watch it but um that was just an unreal that was just so unreal like i've never i'd never been a part of something like that before um been able to watch something that i had done with an audience like that that's a crazy concept to me um and like like Equa and Haria said, you're hearing all the responses and the way that people um, uh, resonate or relate to the the characters of the situations and what do the audience find funny and what do they uh, get emotional about or where you know I love a good amen or mm -hmm or so I was listening for those <laughs> um, and when you could get the, I mean, it was just, it was, it was true. That was like one of the best things uh, about Sundance, just hearing that first crowd respond. Amen. It was so, so surreal, wasn't it? Because I'd never been there. It's my first time there. So I was like, yeah. oh, oh my God. So this is what it's all about. Yeah. I've heard about this place and this festival. So it was surreal and wonderful and nerve wracking too, to see it just, put on the big screen and everyone, you know, and revisiting those moments that seemed so far away so long ago. And then you're looking at it going, oh God, yeah, I remember that. Ah, half of me wanted to hide <laughs> the chairs behind, in front of me. I actually was trying to slip under, cause I have a hard time looking at myself on screen. <laughs> so it was like, Jamie was going, come sit over here. And I'm like, I can't move. <laughs> So, but that was exciting because it was both our first time. So it was like, ah, it was wonderful, but I can't wait to do it again. It will be great, right? To go back. Oh, right? my God. This time I'll be prepared. <laughs> what about you, Natari? Um, what did you think about watching it? Though? I just wish Joao Lee had been at the... Oh, yeah. 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 Is that, that, I mean... For these guys, what they're talking about, just to have that experience firsthand. But I think we were all totally blown away by the response that Joie got. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think she got the loudest audible response. Yes. Yeah. Her scenes got the loudest audible response 
at every screening. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, white Jesus, and then the house would just go down. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, uh, I, I really, I feel, I, I, and I, with me and we sent a message to to Joie that night, a video message, but it didn't translate, of course, because I was like, oh man, I wish he could have seen it. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, even though, you know, even now with the pandemic we're in, you just understand how valuable, how rich, and how what a great opportunity it is to to be able to commune uh, with a piece of art like this yeah. and experience it together. Absolutely. Uh, Timmy Ojo says, this is for Equa. When Esther was cleaning up and setting up the house, she puts up a fish symbol on the wall, but flips flipped upside down. However, near the end, we'll see the symbol upright correctly. All of this was in the background and it was easy to miss. What was the intention symbolizing the displacement of her faith and the eventual clarity she obtained? Or was it pure set dressing and coincidence? <laughs> I'm so amazed that you caught that because I didn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that I I'm wondering if that was either like set dressing or if that like I'm wondering if we flipped the um the image at some point in edit um, and I don't remember, but um, that was not intentional. Um, but I'm glad that it means something to you. <laughs> we planned that all along. Right, right, right. We right. Along. I'm, we're deep, you know what I mean? <laughs> I was going to be really impressed if y'all had planned that out like that. The inner working. It was my fault. It was my fault. I was playing with things with the fish. I thought, let me just show Esther's inner workings by putting the fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. As I know we spoke about this briefly as well, but Jim Cramer, Jen Kramer also wants to know about the, the three different perspectives. And can you talk a little bit about being inspired by that choice? Uh, and she says, thank you so much for this extraordinary film. Thank you. Um, I will also say that I'm a, I'm a great lover of the show, The Affair. Um, and you know, one of the things that I love about The Affair was just how, you know, each person would have an experience, but you know, my my reading of the experience is completely different from the other person's reading. And you know, we didn't have the time, resources, or energy to go as deeply as they did in the affair in terms of having different wardrobe and this, that, and the other. And it didn't quite work for our script, um, but that was definitely one of the inspirations for me in terms of you know just the the question of. Um, seeing the seeing an issue from different perspectives you know we all have our own ideas and our own um assumptions about particular things about whether walter is guilty or not you know whether he should have done it or not whether esther should be as religious as she is whether sylvia should be you know more subordinate or less rude or less quiet or you know whatever the case is um and until you're in that person's shoes, you can't really tell, you know, or you can only tell what you know and where you're from because you're judging it from your own perspective. Um, and so wanting to be able to um, kind of challenge those ideas a little bit by, by showing more perspectives and, and, then, and then let you make a conclusion from there as to how you feel about these characters. And I will say that the three, you know, the three perspectives did get a lot of, I wouldn't use the word pushback, but there was a lot of questions about it from with our collaborators. Like, you know, we went through a couple of the different labs and they were like, oh, I think you should just tell the story linearly. You know, like uh, I went through the, the producing lab and it was like, oh, maybe you guys should tell the story linearly. And I was like, well, you need to tell that to Equa because, <laughs> <laughs> because she is very committed, you know, to, uh, to these perspectives the way that it is, you know? And then I think as the script matured and as the script developed, then it was like, no, this is working. And then even in post, you know, some of our producing partners were like, I think we should edit this linearly let's just try to edit it linearly you know and we knew that that was not going to work because it was not shot that way you know um and it would just make a mess of things but we did it just to show them like okay you wanted to see it 
this is what this looks like linearly, you know? Um, and it was like, oh, no, no, go back to the way that you guys had it. And we were like, thank you. Terrible. Right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And so for Haria and Equa again, how did you, and this is from um, Dana, and they asked, how did you go about casting this film? Everyone was exceptional, by the way. Ah, uh, well, that's, you know, to, we just, you know, I think to their credit, you know, all these actors, they did just, just an amazing job. Um, and I think to Equa's credit, she wrote just amazing characters, you know. Um, I always say that it starts on the page. And if you give, you know, actors something really amazing to work with, and then you couple that with some amazing actors, that's going to be really great. But we worked with a casting director named Rebecca Dealey from Christie Street Casting, and she's just like everything. I love me some Rebecca Dealey. Um, and she gave us phenomenal choices, you know. Um, but Equa, you could you could speak a little bit more about, about that. Yeah, I, I loved working with Rebecca because she was able to really hone in on what it is that I was trying to say for the script. And actually in some parts where, you know, I wasn't seeing what I wanted from, you know, the actors who came in and I was like, oh, what are we missing? And she would explain to me what the script was, which was very illuminating for me to be like, oh, I didn't know it was that, you know, I remember her um, asking her about the Esther part. And, you know, there were people who were just kind of doing one thing, but not doing the other thing. And I was like, what, why are we struggling so much with this? And she was like, it's actually a very layered part that you've written and you may not realize it because, you know, you're just sort of like putting things on pages, but it's very, it, it's not everybody who can actually get all of those things. And that is what we found with Zainab. So it was, it was an easy pick with Zainab because she was the one person who came in was able to hit all the marks very mm -hmm. smoothly and kind of sit like that afterwards and be like, bam, bam, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> um, Rebecca's great with explaining things to actors. I've gone into, uh, I've gone to visit her, oh, gone in for her a few times. And she's always so good at just really like she's, read the script she has mm -hmm. an understanding of it and she really will just point out what it is the director is looking for yeah. even if the director herself hasn't decided at that point or you or, you know mm -hmm. she'll bring up um things that you may not have thought about but she knows how to hit those notes in an actor and uh, especially she's familiar with you and i'm familiar with her she's familiar with my work so it's great to go in for her because you're comfortable first yeah, right. of all. you're comfortable they don't make you they, she puts you at ease and then she because you're at ease, you're able to really listen to what it is that they're looking for and incorporate that into your, your performance. You take notes. And um, that's the one thing I love about Rebecca. She really knows how to put you at ease so you can just like mm. do the work instead of yeah. doing other business with nonsense, nerves and all that. Just, she, <laughs> she just pinpoints what needs to be done. Yeah, yeah. she's really smart that way. Um, and just able to see, I mean, even with the Nzinga character, we had seen a lot of younger Nzingas who, you know, played it a very particular way, which was funny, but it wasn't quite what, it wasn't quite work. It worked better on page than what, you know, than what we were seeing. And again, it was like, oh, Rebecca, what do we do? And she was like, you know, you might want to consider somebody older, you know, a character who's a little bit older. Have you thought of Joie? And I was like, oh, yes, Joie would be great and brought her in and it was exactly what we needed. And really she hit the mark on every single person that she brought in was just like, let me help you. <laughs> this is who you need to be talking to. Um, and we, and it was really lovely. And we knew casting, you know, Walter and casting Sylvia would be challenging because of the fact that um, you have to speak with an accent. You, I mean, you have to be able to deliver the accent and you also have to be able to dance, you know, um, and, you know, working with our financiers, just speaking from that side of things, you know, a lot of times they just want, you know, no names like the oh yeah this guy that was on this poster when i was driving down the freeway that's so you know and it's like no oh that's not gonna work here you know what i mean and we would have a very very different movie um and not as lovely a movie you know if you just sometimes just cast for like the biggest freaking you know and so we just i it was just managing that expectation so that we could actually cast who we wanted to cast to deliver a really amazing film and we were so lucky that we got Atari and Jamie. Mm -hmm. um, before we wrap our last question is if you are able to share what other projects are you all currently working on and oh also, thank you. Anybody want to go first? <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, mom's the word over here. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not able to share, but um, I do have a project that um, I'm lined up for, and it's um, it's a it's a different project. It's a period piece. Um, it's set in the '50s. It's an African American family, um, and I'm very excited to be working on it. It's actually a very huge privilege, and um, hopefully, I'll get to talk about it more in the coming months. <laughs> Yeah. I know everybody's like, eh, we can't. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on going on vacation. That's my next project. Amen. I'm working on going on holiday somewhere hot and sunny and tropical. Yes. That's a wonderful project. <laughs> yes. I'm on that one. Yeah. I have a, another film that's actually coming out in early next year. I think January or February, it's a very similar story. Uh, mm -hmm. But I play the religious parent in this one. Ah. Uh, but it's literally a story about uh, a father who brings his family to the States, um, but he brings his son. It's a son and he literally does step dance um, for a fraternity. Wow. So it's like crazy parallels. <laughs> One thing's in the water. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that will be coming out, it's called Tasmanian Devil. And then I have a, a new series uh, coming out on Netflix, which they haven't announced, so I can't, I can't say what it is, but I um, just feel grateful that, you know, to have some stuff given the challenging times we're all in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I'm reading a bunch of scripts. Um, Echo and I both are, we get so many scripts sent to us all the time um, to work on. So there's some stuff that's really uh, piquing our interest and piquing my interest. And then also I'm writing, I'm spending a lot of time during this quarantine writing, um, which has been really, really cool. So I'm excited about some of the projects that I'm writing. Well, thank you all so very much for this gorgeous film and for chatting with us today. Uh, Farewell or More will be out this Friday, December the 11th on video on demand and anywhere that you can go to the movies or drive in. Uh, so thank you so much. This was such a wonderful discussion.